All across the country, you know, um, things were going up in flames, almost literally. Unfortunately, you know, uh, at that time was uh, the height of uh, oppression uh, in the country. And um, the libraries weren't exempted from, from these developments. Uh, and uh, I know of libraries that became sites of um, uh, arson attacks um, by different um, political groups. Um, and on the other hand, libraries also becoming places uh, to gather and to discuss political strategy. Uh, so librarians would offer uh, um, their, their space, you know, to, um, in, that, in that case, mostly young um, high school students. The point I'm making is that there was a sort of diverse group and librarians, you know, had to be able to use the library as a sort of a neutral, an open uh, space, like a marketplace for ideas. Um, for these debates, um, at the same time, shielding them from the, the threats of security police, who often were parked just outside the library, you know, in Saracens and um, disguised as plainclothes policemen and so forth. Prison libraries are often places that uh, um, have books donated to them or um, bookshops that shut down um, and the surplus is sent there. So it ends up, you know, you end up with things that are not really are going to contribute to your political education. But the point is that prisoners read these books in really interesting ways, you know. So you could read Charles Dickens and you could read um, George Eliot for, for social commentary, you know, things about inequality, class um, uh, divisions, and, and so on and so forth. But in the prisons themselves, there was a diversity. Like I said, Tolstoy was well read, but uh, th there was often a sort of a hunger for books alive with people, as Albi Sachs said, um, and uh, books that uh, had to do with, with, with family, because these prisoners were, you know, um, they had no family life. But what's interesting is that if you look at the history of librarianship in South Africa, you'll find that there were sort of more alternative um, uh, approaches. There was, in the 19... Um, the 20s and 30s, you know, uh, um, a black newspaper called the Bantu World um, spoke about the library movement and what they meant was that readers of books in libraries should read in order to also write uh, and then insert African authors into the English canon so that if you go to a library you just don't find, you know, your Shakespeare and your Wordsworth and your Keats but you'll also find your Salt Plyke and you'll find your Peter Abrams and, and so on. Just to, to mention one last thing, uh, prisoners also did eventually get to, um, uh, to see um, films, uh, many films, um, and get access to radio broadcasts. But the films, interestingly, in the case of Nelson Mandela, um, who was quite picky about what he read and what he saw, but he, he did say this, any film that includes Sophia Loren, he wants to see. Uh, we have a young, young generation who don't know very much about the kind of things I went through. So on the one hand, I don't want to be, you know, in my days, things were like this. Um, on the other hand, you know, you, you want them to, to remember that, uh, you know, it's often, as somebody said, bad things happen when good, good men don't do anything. I suppose it's good men and women don't do anything. Um, so on the one hand, you, you feel that the, the new generation should actually, you know, be free from the, the kinds of things we saw and get on with life and become part of the global community and so on. On the other hand, you, you want them also to, to have a, a record to go back to, um, to be able to, uh, to see you know, what it was that the, the previous generation, their parents and grandparents and so on, had to sacrifice in order for them to, to appreciate this new South Africa, as we call it. And it's all part of the, the history, and I think the, the full picture, the, the whole story, uh, deserves to be told.